Aquí, no más. It's a Spanish phrase I learned recently from a friend. His response when I asked what was going on. Aquí, no más. Just here, nothing more. It's the place to which Jesus invites the young man of means in our scripture. Preoccupied with the future, he asks Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? To which Jesus replies, if you wish to enter life, keep the commandments. Consider life here, now, nothing more. Aquí, no más. This is a signature move of Jesus throughout the Gospels to shift the focus from getting people into heaven to getting heaven into people. That Jesus offers the Ten Commandments reveals their intended purpose in shaping life on earth as it is in heaven, as we pray each week. Where life is respected, where all are treated with dignity, where neighbors are loved, and where all are free from fear, oppression, and lack. This exquisite kinship with God and others, Jesus seems to suggest, is the ground beneath our feet. It's not just around the corner, it is the corner. The radical reconciliation of all life is not merely a future reward reserved for a select few, but is here and now within everyone's reach. Love, Jesus taught repeatedly, is ever unfolding, channeled and embodied in the everyday stuff of life and relationships and the present moment. Just right here, no more. Well, I've kept the, all the commandments since my youth, the man counters. You lack one thing, Jesus replies. Go sell what you own and share it with the poor. How his wealth hindered love's unfolding in his life, we can only guess. Perhaps it made him less generous and more uncaring, neglectful of family and friends and those in need around him. Perhaps his need for more consumed his life. Maybe he buys the myth of scarcity, fearful there isn't enough to go around, and so he's hoarding all he can while others suffer unjust realities. Whatever the reason, Jesus confronts him with the truth of the matter and of his true self, and the young man goes away sadly. The truth will set us free, the saying goes, but first it will make us miserable. It can indeed be sad and difficult letting go of our old selves to become a newer, truer version of ourselves. But that sadness finally turns to joy when we remove the hindrances and welcome a deeper authenticity. At least that's what I like to imagine happens to the young man. Sometimes it is against ourselves we bear false witness. Out of necessity or survival or fear, we can uphold the lie for a long time. While the original Ninth Commandment of not giving false testimony concerned a commitment to the truth in the courtroom, the Torah and many other parts of the Hebrew Scriptures expand the meaning of the Ninth Commandment to include lying in general. Deceptive, slanderous, and empty talk about other persons that would undermine their reputation or otherwise cast them in a bad light was to be avoided. Positively, the commandment called the community to use speech constructively, to so speak of others that their well-being is furthered and enhanced. Enfleshed reimagines the ninth commandment even further. Do not hinder justice from coming to fruition. It may sound like a far cry from the original, but it is not. For justice, I think, begins with commitment to truth. We don't bring truth into the world, Father Boyle wrote. It brings us. What hinders tenderness in our lives, which is what love feels like in private? How do we hinder social justice from coming to fruition, which is what love looks like in public? 
Thank you, Cornell West. I was so moved this week watching the Netflix, Netflix documentary, Will and Harper, about a road trip that Will Farrell and his dear friend Harper Steele take across the U.S. It is a vulnerable portrayal of their friendship since Harper's transition and being out as a trans woman. Harper told the New York Times this week, there's a social justice part of this movie because I'm reading the newspaper every day and more and more trans bills are being offered up. And it's making me think, well, we can do something. There's a process of normalizing queer people in America, and this movie tries to do that. It makes the trans experience more understandable. It's representation in a good way. Throughout the film, there are terrifying and exposing moments along their trip but there are also many moments of surprising solidarity and support among those least expected to offer it. I found myself making snap judgments about how people would respond to Harper when a scene began at a rodeo, for example. It challenged me to confront my own biases and the ways I keep myself divided from others. But it also brought to mind the capacity that we all have for tremendous understanding and love. I love places like this, Harper shares at the rodeo with a curious parent and his young child. But I wasn't sure I could ever come back to them after my transition. The father looks directly into Harper's eyes and says, I think you should, as Harper is brought to tears. Here, now nothing more. Judgment born of fear, born of ignorance, so easily fills the space in us that love longs to be. Love that is born of curiosity and wonder. The 14th century mystic Julian of Norwich contended that the truest and most authentic spiritual life is one that produces awe, humility, and love. I also think Richard Rohr was right when he said that we don't think ourselves into a new way of being. We live ourselves into a new way of thinking. I've yet to have an experience with someone that I was taught knowingly or unknowingly to fear, where that fear was not dispelled immediately upon learning their story and being in relationship. The truth brings us into the world. Dehumanization, writes Isabel Wilkerson in Caste, is a war against truth. Against what the eye can see and what the heart could feel if allowed to do so on its own. It takes energy and re reinforcement to deny the self-evident humanity and dignity in another. It is harder to dehumanize an individual you have gotten the chance to know. So better to attach a stigma and taint of pollution to an entire group. Do that, and you have completed the work of dehumanizing any single person within it, so that any action against them is seen as reasonable. We have seen dehumanization's devastation at our southern border in our treatment of migrants and asylum seekers, and in the ongoing daily disparaging of immigrants in our news cycle. It is at work in our justice system through the cruelties of solitary confinement and capital punishment. It is at work in our economy with exorbitant handouts for those at the top and rugged pull-yourself-up-by-your-bootstraps individualism for those on the bottom just trying to get ahead. We've witnessed dehumanization's devastation in Israel and Gaza, in the West Bank and Lebanon, and whenever violence and mass death are justified against people yearning to breathe free. 
We must take seriously the physical violence and threats of physical violence posed by the dangerous ideological and political movement of Christian nationalism. To be honest about and responsive to the toll, both psychological and material, it is wreaking on communities of color, non-Christian communities, and queer communities in this country. To shine a light on the truth of this movement that lies about the inherent superiority of those who are white and Christian. We can courageously counter it by nurturing even deeper and more authentic solidarity. And I feel that our community's call to this work will only become more immediate in the weeks and months ahead. And I believe with all my heart that we will meet this moment with all the courage and love we have. There is seldom a day when your ministers do not hear from you about your election anxiety. We're feeling it too. So please know that we are always here for you to listen and lament, to pray, and to practice hope. When preoccupation with fear, with and fear of the future takes hold, I find great solace in remembering all with whom we share this life. The spirit that unites us buoys us with hope. So let us lean into each other now more than ever. Last week, Reverend Laura spoke poignantly about our community's contributions toward and cementing of Christian nationalism's roots in America some decades ago and how we are challenging that movement's gross distortions and outright lies about the teachings of Jesus, who bids us come and follow the way of truth, justice, and love. But today I want to share some even deeper roots, the very fibers of this community's beginnings in the year 1867. We may know that First Church began in the living room of Amanda Scott, her great vision and leadership founded this community. But I also want to speak the name of Reverend Alexander Parker, the first minister this church called to serve. Parker was a radical abolitionist who attended my alma mater, Oberlin College, which was a stop on the Underground Railroad. As First Church grew and planned the building of its first sanctuary, the courthouse in LA granted Amanda Scott and Reverend Parker permission to hold services there for a time. Because of considerable Confederate sentiment still in LA following the Civil War and resentment towards Congregationalists in general, who helped defeat a measure before the war that would have divided California and made Southern California its own state supportive of slavery. First Church was eyed with suspicion. Its ministers and members were considered agitators. Noisy meetings and shows and plays were scheduled intentionally at the same time as their worship services on the floor above them. Oh, to have been in those services, getting into what the great John Lewis would call good trouble, to sing and shout, preach and pray in a courthouse of people refusing to bear false witness against their black siblings whose dehumanization continued in L.A. I'm reclaiming those roots for this community today. <clears throat> Remember your ancestors, implored Choctaw elder Stephen Charleston, and remember your story. When we remember, we create a continuity that connects our past with our future. Community is memory. Kinship is memory shared. 
when Ianthi lost her nono some years ago, the first close person in her life to pass. She shared with her best friend how comforted she was by a thought she'd never felt before. Her grandfather's life going on somehow, in total peace, beyond suffering. She asked her friend, who is Jewish, where she in her faith finds comfort amid death. Her friend replied, we're comforted by the mitzvot, the commandments a loved one did and kept throughout their life here. She was speaking of theirs and our own part in the tikkun olam, the repair and mending of the world. To enter life here, now, nothing more, aqui no mas, wrote the late Reverend Dr. James Lawson. Our lives speak even now and ask How shall we change the world? May I propose we begin here. Resist being daunted by the enormity of the world's grief, to echo the Talmud, and rekindle the fierce urgency of now, to echo echo Dr. King. To do justly now. Love mercy now. Walk humbly now. Stay close to the despised, the rejected, the isolated, and do not turn away from the suffering of those on the margins. Speak up when people and groups are being lied about and dehumanized. Remove every hindrance, every hindrance that holds us back from sharing compassionate and tender hearts, every hindrance holding others back every hindrance holding the creatures back, holding God's beloved world back from peace and life abundant. Yes, remove every hindrance and let justice roll down like waters and truth and love like an ever-flowing stream, a stream that will not run dry. Hallelujah and amen.